Hi, I'm Dr. Carl Krub, and you're watching Prevention Live. I want to welcome our viewers here. This is our first time in the new studios um, of uh, Community Media Network, and I want to thank uh, Jay and Marlo for continuing to encourage me to come out here and see these new facilities, and they are beautiful. It's a wonderful job, and I'm happy to be here. And uh, I wanted to begin uh, today's show. Uh, we're going to get right into it because uh, I'm a little bit behind on some of these articles. Uh, the first article we want to present today uh, re is regarding the uh, uh, FDA's extinguishing the plans to add nicotine to water. On prior shows, uh, we've discussed the medical benefits of nicotine, uh, which uh, tends to explain why so many people become addicted to, to nicotine. Uh, these people aren't stupid, and their bodies are, are actually uh, becoming dependent on a substance that does some interesting things. Nicotine, as you know, is an anti-anxiety agent, reduces nervousness, reduces panic, uh, tends to improve eye-hand coordination, which explains why major leaguers chew tobacco. Uh, the major leaguers aren't stupid either. They need to hit those baseball pitches. Uh, hitting a baseball pitch, as you know, is supposed to be one of the hardest things in all of, uh, of sports. Um, uh, so anyway, they got the idea that maybe we, don't, we can get the nicotine without the smoke, so we'll put nicotine in water. Uh, actually, interesting idea, but uh, obviously there's a, a potential for abuse by children and young adults, uh, so they felt maybe high schoolers might get into this nicotine water. So they trashed the idea. So um, we'll have to wait for something else to come up maybe to help us with uh, getting rid of the uh, nicotine habit. Uh, let's go quickly. I have uh, quite a few articles here. We'll talk about uh, uh, this next one here. Uh, as we know, uh, uh, I believe May is the, and this is May 1st as we're filming today, um, uh, 2003 if this is going to be a rerun sometime in the future. <laughs> At any rate, uh, uh, the ABCs of skin cancer, as we uh, get out, we have these very short s uh, spring and summer in Michigan. Uh, as you know, it's May 1st, and we're just starting to get our spring weather. Uh, so we don't really have uh, that much sun exposure in Michigan, but some people do go out there and try to lay on the beach and take all the sun in that they can uh, in the spring and summer. The ABCs of uh, skin cancer, as you can see on the screen, asymmetric shape, which is irregular, border irregularity. A color variation or a change, diameter larger than a pencil eraser, and elevation above the skin. Obviously, all of us, there are no exceptions, uh, and uh, uh, have uh, lesions on the skin or, or little blemishes or marks that weren't there before. That's a natural part of aging. Most of these lesions are benign. Uh, we need to know, though, when to draw the attention of a dermatologist uh, to these lesions, and this ABCs of uh, skin cancer is helpful. And I think that May is the uh, Skin Cancer Awareness Month, if I'm not mistaken, along with a lot of other months. I also heard it was Osteoporosis Month or Prevention Month. So anyway, keep that in mind and um, be careful of your sun exposure. We like to enjoy the short season we have for sunshine in Michigan, uh, but let's not overdo it. Uh, let me see. I'm going to have to be selective in what I talk about today because I only have this hour. Uh, Smoking-related deaths worldwide are said to be total of 4 million a year. Is that the bad news? Because there's bad news and worse news. The bad news is, yes, 4 million people die on this globe uh, from cigarette smoking. The worst news is that all these cigarettes these people are smoking come from the United States. So when we, when we sell cigarettes, when we sell landmines, when we are the largest exporter of weapons, uh, we become uh, really sort of, in a way, responsible for the, indirectly for these, for these deaths. So I think really we should take a hard look at uh, selling uh, substance. It's one thing if Americans smoke cigarettes. Uh, that's our decision. We, we're adults. But to actually sell these things and cause other children and other high schools and other countries to become addicted to nicotine uh, is, uh, I think, irresponsible. And we should be more responsible about how we uh, uh, treat and what we sell to other countries. And that would include weapons, too. As you know, the United States is the largest weapons uh, seller. So uh, uh, we just recently got through with this Iraq business, but you know it's, it may interest the uh, viewers to know who, who don't already know that those Iraqi weapons were all made here. Th those those weapons of mass they were all made here. Everything that they had was made here. Everything they used, everything they shot at us with, we sold them. So we have to be careful about what we we send overseas. Uh, going down the list, uh, studies show is estrogen therapy to raise risk of ovarian cancer. Uh, as uh, if you're a patient at my office, you're aware that we are look, taking a very hard look uh, at every case uh, in, uh, in which a woman is taking estrogen. Uh, we're becoming much more, f uh, 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 more um, skeptical of these estrogen claims, and uh, we have stopped a lot of estrogen prescriptions on this basis. The only people right now that I feel can continue estrogen, according to what I've read, are those who really have a very bad hot flash problem, 
that cannot be resolved by other methods. Uh, and then also, so in some cases, where a woman has uh, severe osteoporosis but is not able to take the other medications for osteoporosis. For example, uh, Evista or Fosamax uh, or Miocalcin or um, uh, Actinel. These are the current drugs available, all estrogen alternatives you might call them. If you're unable to tolerate those and your bone density is clearly low, uh, this would be an indication. But apparently, uh, there has been some lack of uh, clarification of the cancer risk with estrogen. If you're an estrogen user out watching tonight or this morning, because this show is rebroadcast at 8 in the morning on Thursdays, but if you're watching this show and you're taking estrogen and your doctor said it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, you know, uh, you might want to go tell your doctor that, you know, I was reading some news, don't mention my name, and, uh, and say that, you know, I, I, I am concerned about these risks. Can I get off this estrogen? And it may be possible for you to get off it. We'll keep on moving here. Scientists report construction of polio virus from scratch. What is, how does that affect us? Why do we need to review this article when I only have an hour to spend with you tonight? Why would I spend even a minute on this article? Well, we're constructing things, all right? Um, we talk about weapons of mass destruction. Well, here's one that we eradicated in America. This was a scourge during the Great Depression. Uh, I am not too uh, young to remember when it was common to have people in wheelchairs who had suffered from polio. Now, uh, now it's true that today most of those people have uh, gotten old and passed on or moved to Florida. <laughs> but at any rate, it should be understood that if, if uh, the, when science does these things, the military is never far behind. Do you understand that? When, when, when the military is never too behind the scientists when, with respect to things like this. So we really should be discouraging scientists from co uh, constructing viruses because it's giving ideas to the military. We give ideas to the military. Some company, maybe by the name of Halliburton or the Kyle, uh, Carlisle Group or something like this in America, gets the idea to make a weapon out of it. All of a sudden, we find that there's another country interested in buying that weapon and then again, we're exporting these weapons, and then we're going to war over the weapons. So maybe the problem with these weapons of mass destruction is we should stop these people from these ideas of constructing a, a virus that's practically extinct. What do we want to do that for? Uh, let's see. Um, uh, oh, we mourn the passage of Dr. Donald S. Fr uh, Fredrickson. This is the first doctor, he just died at 77, who linked fat, to heart disease. So if you think that link has been established for many, many, many years, you're wrong. In fact, the first link of cholesterol to heart attack came when? When would you imagine? 1912? I'll make it a multiple choice. 1984, 1964, 1944, 1924. What's your answer? Ding, ding, ding. The answer is 1984. Believe it or not, we had no hard, fast study linking cholesterol and heart disease until 1984. All right. Sometimes we're a little bit slow on things. Um, let me go. Oh, you know what? This was an interesting article, uh, if I may discuss it. You know, uh, I think that I, uh, oh, by the way, I wanted to thank the Beaumont nurses. I was uh, uh, privileged to be uh, uh, to give a lecture at the Best Western Hotel in uh, Sterling Heights to uh, an outstanding group. I really, really honestly enjoyed uh, spending time with that group of nurses. Many have been friends of mine for over 25 years. And uh, we did review many of these articles. I promised uh, that I would uh, clarify a few of the points today. But before I do, I want to talk about uh, Dr. Carrico, who was at the uh, Park, is it the Par uh, Park Memorial Hospital where they brought Kennedy when he was first shot? Uh, th uh, those watching who were probably uh, 40 and older can remember clearly uh, when, uh, when our President Kennedy was shot. It was traumatic. I don't think anybody's ever forgotten uh, or gotten over completely the trauma of losing that great president. Uh, I think that, uh, that much has been said about Kennedy since then. Much of it has to do with either Marilyn Monroe or cover-up or conspiracy. Is that true? When we think of Kennedy, we think of Marilyn Monroe, conspiracy. Isn't that, that's, all, that's the legacy of John F. Kennedy, I'm sorry to say. Uh, the point I'm making here is that the, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the doctors who was there, one of the first to see Kennedy, uh, recently died. His name was Dr. Carrico, 
and he was, uh, he was a surgical resident at Park Memorial. Again, I, uh, forgive me if I'm mistaken about the name of the hospital. I believe it was Park Memorial. And uh, he was asked, when he got older, uh, he was asked, you know, that Dr. Carrico lots been said about this Kennedy thing. You were there with him. Were there CIA agents taking bullets and making holes and <laughs> covering up things? And, uh, and Dr. Carrico said uh, a very simple and I thought tender-hearted answer, which should allay the concerns of those Americans who still believe that there was some kind of a conspiracy. And that was that in the immediate time around the death of President Kennedy, those doctors who were in attendance at, at his bedside were so personally stunned to see their president lying before them in this, in this way, in this condition, that none of them had the heart to touch him. And if you think about it, and you, you put yourself as a resident in 1963, November 22nd, put yourself at the side of the president, and imagine the sadness and the horror and the shock. These doctors are people and they're Americans. And you know, when I, when I read his, his, his evaluation, his review of what happened that day, I had no doubt in my mind that there was nothing done and nothing covered up. The only reason the autopsy was delayed was because of who this was. It was just, you know, many times at Beaumont Hospital, uh, I have been in the sad position to inform a family that a, rel a loved one has died uh, under our care. And uh, this may do, be due to advanced age or cancer or whatever the reason, even if the reason seems to be a, 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 a something the patient in the family was expecting. The, the, the news of the death is, is, uh, is quite a shock, even in someone in whom you're expecting it, much less someone you're not expecting much less a beloved figure, a national figure like this. So I, I really believe Dr. Carrico, and God rest his soul and, uh, and bless his family. I believe that he's telling the truth. I believe that the, the surgeons just didn't have the heart to do an autopsy. These patients that we see at Beaumont Hospital frequently don't want an autopsy done on their loved one because they can't even, they're so stunned at the death that they can't hardly imagine doing an autopsy. They haven't even accepted the notion that the relative is expired. So, so in my opinion, I think we can put this autopsy and this conspiracy business to rest. These doctors were human beings who simply delayed the autopsy because they were a, a combination of uh, traumatized and shocked by the loss of their uh, beloved president. That's all this was. And I'll move along from that. Um, oh, goodness. Uh, this is an article. I wanted to talk about this, but I'm really running out of time. Hi, Marlo. Uh, uh, this is an article about uh, uh, heart valves and pacemakers and various sundry things they're putting in people these days to uh, extend life in people who have cardiac disease. The article, the essence of the article is that if your valve is recalled or your pacemaker is recalled by the manufacturer, there is no legal uh, mandate that m means you need to be contacted about this, uh, this recall. You know, if you have a Ford car, GM car, Chrysler car, and they, some valve or some tire thing or some gas leak thing or, uh, is not working or needs, is recalled. You get a letter, right, in the mail? You get a letter, open it up. Uh, all 1993 Corvettes or whatever uh, are being recalled to replace this valve, which may cause a fire, et cetera. Well, for cardiac devices, life-saving cardiac devices, there is no such mandate that the manufacturer needs to contact each and every person who has received it. So what I'm saying is if you have a pacemaker or artificial valve, it's really your responsibility to call your cardiologist or check with them and say, has my valve been recalled? Has my pacemaker been recalled? You have to kind of ask about that. It's kind of silly, right? But uh, until there's some law about this, we're going to have to uh, take a, a, this kind of a, an approach uh, with respect to these things. All right. Again, I have so many articles. Uh, and, and I guess in this fella, uh, he received a heart valve that was contaminated with fungus. So I guess another question to ask before you get the heart valve is, uh, have you checked the valve for fungus before you take I'm just kidding. Obviously, that's an aberration. Um, uh, mayor Bloomberg, as you know, uh, bought the mayorship of New York. It's a, a poorly kept secret that he, he's a multi-billionaire guy who wanted to become mayor of New York and 
very fortunately for me, Dr. Blumberg does not, or Mr. Blum, Blumberg does not watch this program. I don't think he does anyway. But he certainly could afford to if he wanted to. <laughs> right, Marla? He could have his own camera put in here, beamed into his house, satellite. Uh, but uh, th this is, seems to be the trend in politics now, is uh, a billionaire uh, buys public office and uh, whatever else goes with it. Uh, what did, he, what did uh, Al Pacino say in Scarface? First you get the money, then you get the power, then you get the woman. I had a patient today complaining about the, uh, the politicians in America. And I said, never vote for a politician who cried at the end of Scarface. See? Good rule there. Anyway, what I'm saying here about Mayor Blumberg is he's done something interesting. So we can't fault him altogether. He is, if you, if you, anybody here raise your hand if you've been to New York City. It's appalling, the noise level on the street. Just appalling. You, you know, besides the air, the, the noise, the noise that you hear in New York, the, the car horns alone is unbelievable. If you're walking along New York, uh, if you're inside of a car and the windows are shut, it may not be so bad. But if you're walking, a pedestrian in New York City walking around, the, the car horns blasting constantly, you, you, you will lose hearing. Anyway, uh, Mayor Bloomberg is, he wants to cut down the noise pollution in New York City. And I think that's wonderful. And I'm telling you something, that I, I, know, I know of a patient who died of noise, just from noise. This patient was exposed to a very loud noise using a yard machine, one of these machines that either cuts the lawn or does this and there, blows the leaves. And he had a heart attack, and the only risk we could find for the heart attack was prolonged exposure to this noise. And we know that prolonged noise exposure can lead to high blood pressure, rapid heart rate, and even angina, and then sudden death. So uh, cutting down noise is a very good thing. When I got to the studio today, and again, I want to tell you how pleased I was at the changes here at the studio. And I'm not just saying this because Milo's behind the first camera here. But they had nice soft music playing, very quiet here. I can't hear anything. Last time I was here, you could hear the street sounds, you could hear all kinds of things. Uh, I don't hear anything. It's quiet and I'm relaxed. I'm so relaxed. It's nice. Anyway, that's the thing about noise. If you are an employer and you, and you employ people, and you can do something about the noise, even if you can get noise cancelers for those people. All right, good idea. Earplugs. OSHA now demands that. When I grew up, uh, I, I have no doubt I have a little high frequency hearing loss myself. I grew up in my father's print shop. There were no OSHA regulations back then. There was no uh, need for, we had all kinds of machines running at my father's print shop. And uh, I have no doubt at all that uh, that, that noise pollution does contribute to, to heart disease and also to ear disease. So at any rate, the point is if you're an employer, uh, be respectful of your employees and try to cut down the noise if you can or use the, uh, the ear protection. If you're an employee and you're recognizing a, a lot of stress from the noise at work, mention it to your employer, all right? There's a reason to. Um, this is a picture of my younger brother, Frederick, who right now is watching, the, watching over the patients at the office and I wanted to thank him. In the background to his left is my office manager, Susan. I have no idea why this picture's on the camera, but there it is. <laughs> uh, and that is Mira, uh, our ultrasound young lady. And let's go here. Um, oh, I wanted to talk about uh, just this is an illustrated interesting point. Uh, this uh, Charles Mount, he died, he's age 60, designed 300 restaurants. And uh, he was one of these fast food uh, uh, tycoons. And uh, if you look at the second paragraph, it says he had a heart attack while eating breakfast. Now, I thought that was worthy of comment, if you may uh, just give me a couple minutes of your time here. You know that um, they say breakfast is the most important meal of the day. The problem is that, that the um, caveat with that is that provided this is a high fiber, lots of fresh fruit, uh, etc. type of a breakfast. If a person's eating eggs and sausage and bacon and more sausage and, uh, and these, this then can be a heart disease promoting breakfast. So these uh, people that are eating these fast food breakfasts, if you're going to, let me, let me summarize. If you're going to eat fast food, I understand, but can you please at least eat a healthy breakfast? At least if you're going to eat bad all day, Remember, heart attack most common time is between 7 and 11 in the morning. If you've eaten a very high fat, very high cholesterol breakfast, 
and then maybe smoked a couple cigarettes, then got in the rush hour traffic. You are tempting fate if you're trying to protect yourself from dying of heart disease. You're tempting fate by eating a, a lard filled, fat filled breakfast like this. So this man died, there he is, he's 60. He's a fast food tycoon. You like that? You want to die at 60? You know what? Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It's not a cliche, but it is only a good meal for us if it can be high in antioxidants. So my advice, go, go heavy, heavy, heavy on the fresh fruits, all right? Uh, maybe an omelet with egg whites, a lot of vegetables in the omelet, maybe some onions, maybe some mushrooms, maybe some green peppers and some tomatoes for your prostate. But take it easy on these meats and these heavy sausage type things that make breakfast your least healthy meal of the day and could lead to a morning heart attack. And God rest the soul of Mr. Mount who died after breakfast at age 60. All right. Uh, I think we're going to talk about this on our next show, Fixing Aneurysms. Forgive me as we go through here. Uh, quickly shoot down to... All right. Uh, anger, studying the subconscious na uh, nature of rage. Uh, the reason for this article today is to indicate to those viewing the in the audience today who have a hair trigger temper. Raise your hand out there. I can't see into your t living room there. Do you, have you been accused of having, a, you'll never admit of course, but have you ever been accused of having a bad temper? If your hand is going up reluctantly or your wife is telling you or your husband's telling you that you should raise your hand for that question, then we have a problem. And it's not that different from the high, high fat breakfast. And that is that people who have a tendency toward rage have a higher risk for heart attack. Is that a hard correlation to understand? No. But maybe you need to understand that that correlation has been made. If you have a good cholesterol, if you have a extra, uh, you're thin, eat fiber, uh, don't have diabetes, but you are, you are prone to rage and sudden temper tantrums, your risk for heart attack is doubled, if not tripled, all right? How do you, how do you take care of this? Well, the sure, the, an answer for the person who has a bad temper and rage, uh, in the, and there's an Arab proverb that is if you're about to lose your temper and you're standing, sit down. If you're about to lose your temper and you're sitting down, lay down, <laughs> okay? so. You see, the, the Arabs, they have a philosophy about almost everything. But the, the idea here is that the person, they standing, they're about to get mad and get angry, sit, you know, sit down. You're sitting and you're getting angry, lay down, all right? In other words, suppress the outburst. Suppress the outburst. Try to control yourself. Um, this is not the same thing as holding in your emotions. Rage is not good for the heart. It's not good for the soul. It's not good for this life, and it's probably not too good for the next life, all right? I think you could talk about that with your clergy. All right, let's go over to this camera. Uh, okay, this was an article on doctor's poor handwriting. You know, for, for years, uh, people have asked me uh, at lectures where I had uh, people in attendance, and then situations like this where we had uh, television shows, and uh, would, uh, what is with doctor's handwriting, all right? Uh, why, isn't, why aren't there laws that mandate doctors write better? How can it be that people die each year due to poor handwritten prescriptions? Well, um, this is one of those things sort of like the, um, the other issue we talked about a few minutes ago. Uh, we do need to do something about this. My feeling is the long-term solution for prescription errors because of handwriting is going to end up being uh, computer-written prescriptions. Now, you know these... Uh, uh, dictation uh, software that uh, you can dictate into the computer and it'll print up what you th That's still limited because a lot of mistakes are still made doing that. Um, but I think that uh, handwritten prescriptions are really something from the dark ages, sort of like when we didn't know that cholesterol caused heart disease. So hopefully in the future, uh, doctors will no longer be able to uh, send to pharmacies handwritten prescriptions. I don't care how good your handwriting is. It will have to be by computer. Interestingly, if, if prescriptions were written by computer, the software could be uh, modified so that if a doctor call, uh, dictated an in, incorrect dosage or a medication that had interaction with another medication, the computer would go error, error, you know, and that would be interesting because in, in this case, if you write it, there's no, no checks on that and there's no computer to check that. Hopefully, we will have more computers and then handwriting will be abolished in medicine. Uh, Let's go to our next article here, and uh, 
Uh, and here's another article uh, verifying what we said earlier, that if you're taking estrogen for hot flashes, in view or in light of the new uh, information on the risk of cancer, maybe the hot flash isn't so bad. And this article points out that uh, this article really was about uh, a stock in the estrogen making company. But it really points out that maybe a little hot flash is okay if, if the penalty of taking estrogen is cancer. All right, something to think about. Okay, uh, we wanted to make a comment here about this gastric bypass surgery. Uh, the most famous recent example is this Al Roker from, I'm not sure what channel he's on. Uh, he's a weatherman, right, Marlo? Is he weather? NBC. NBC he's on. Marlo informs me that he's on NBC. And uh, Al Roker lost a ton of weight uh, by having gastric bypass. And um, the only one that could really compete with the gastric bypass, who we, we lament the passing of, uh, is Dr. Um, Adkins, who I guess fell in New York and uh, had, a, had a brain injury. Um, and um, he died from the brain. But anyway, the, the point I want to make is that uh, uh, the only one who could get a lot, a lot of weight loss was with this high protein diet, this no carbohydrate diet. So these two alternatives for uh, excessive obesity, what you might call morbid obesity, or obesity that threatens the health of the individual. And uh, I've been asked my opinion on this bariatric surgery, these gastric bypass surgeries that, uh, that subject the patient to some significant risk in order to obtain, achieve this weight loss. And my feeling is that uh, only if the patient's uh, life is in danger should they subject themselves to the surgery. I don't know the case of Al Roker. I don't know if he had life-threatening heart disease, life-threatening hypertension. Uh, I don't know what his story was. But if it's for cosmetic reasons only, I still am opposed to it. All right? I still would like to see the person go on a combined exercise uh, and Weight Watcher-like program where they're, uh, but heavy on the exercise, even if it's just walking. Because if you think about it, Al Roker, I did not know him. I don't know who he is too well. But, and I didn't know him in high school when he might have still been thin. But I will tell you that probably what's happened to him is what happened to many people. And that is that from the ages of 18, 19 to the age of 40, 45, period of over 20 years, a person adds about 5, 10 pounds a year. Okay? Uh, 20 years goes by, 5 pounds a year, they're 100 pounds heavier. Did you get that? Usually when people are this overweight, they're adding about five pounds a year over 20 years. What's five times 20? All right. Now, the person wants to lose the weight, but they don't want to lose it five pounds a year over 20 years, right? He doesn't want to wait till he's 60 losing five pounds a year. He wants to lose it all at once. There's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. So number one, my advice to you, if you're in high school, uh, where at least, you know, when you're in high school, somebody is still looking after your physical fitness, right? You're still getting a grade in gym in high school, right? After high school, 18, it's over. Nobody is looking after your physical fitness anymore. Nobody cares how many chin-ups you can do. Nobody cares how many pull-ups or how fast you can run the 100-yard dash anymore. After high school, it's up to you. And frankly, uh, Americans are doing a miserable job uh, with fitness. I had to laugh at that. Senator Rangel, congressional, I don't know if it's representative or Senator Rangel, who said we should reinstate the draft. I had to laugh as a doctor in Royal Oak, Michigan. I had to laugh my head off about that. Can you imagine how long basic training would be for your average guy living on one of these streets around here? Be about a year of basic training. Back in 1941, when, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, you know, people, there was no air conditioning. There were no attached garages. There, there, were, there were no uh, 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 services to come and change your tire. There were no shopping malls. Uh, there were no school buses. You know, Americans, you know, Americans were ready for war in 1941. We were ready for it. The basic training took six weeks at the most. The most of the people came down thin and fit already. They're thin and fit already. You know, we'd be in big trouble because more Americans look like Al Roker in the before picture than in the after picture. Okay, I don't want to talk too much about this. We have too many articles to talk about. The point I want to get at in the sum to summarize is that I wish that some of our overweight friends, relatives, patients, and viewers would take an approach of about maybe five, five or 10 pounds per year as their goal for weight loss, not 50 pounds a month with a bypass surgery that's life-threatening, all right? I know that you'd love to lose that weight that took you 20 years to gain over a period of a month. That's a great idea. 
But it's not going to happen that way. It's going to happen a little at a time. Be patient. That's why I think this Florine Mark and her Weight Watcher program is much more realistic. Uh, they basically emphasize exercise and calorie, watching your calories. And it's a very slow but steady. Right? Well, what do you want? Real fast loss and then gain? Or do you want nice and steady, consistent loss? Even if it's just about 5 or 10 pounds a year. Right? Let's say that those of you watching today are 25 pounds, 25 pounds overweight. Or let's say you'd like to lose 25 pounds. Well, it's 2003, May the 1st. Let's say by May 1st, 2008, we'll lose 30 pounds, or, and then we'll go on a program for that purpose. You know, that would be easy to do. You have to be realistic, though, if you really want to keep the weight off. Um, now, this is an article, and I, I don't want to talk too much about it, but... Uh, uh, for years on Prevention Live and uh, through the years here at uh, this studio and the other studios we've been at over the years, uh, you've heard me say that uh, Americans should restrict their red meat, and that was before mad cow disease, right? That was before mad cow disease. Uh, we said restrict red meat and try to eat more fish. You've heard us say on the show that uh, fish oil is good against cancer, stroke, heart disease. Um, it's good for blood pressure. Uh, it's good for the brain. It's good for circulation. Uh, and then we had a series of articles indicating that the mercury and PCB in, in fish was suggesting for the first time that maybe even fish wasn't as healthy as we thought. So now we've had to kind of take a different stance, and that is the following. You should, of course, restrict red meat with or without mad cow disease. Did you know the Red Cross won't take blood from you if you've been to England recently? Does that tell you something? They're, they're afraid that while you were in England, you might have eaten some, some meat, right? Some beef. And they're afraid if they take your blood, they'll contaminate the blood supply with mad cow disease. So if that doesn't tell you something, I mean, you should pay attention to stuff. The Red Cross will not take your blood if you've been to England recently. So obviously, we should cut down our red meat, right? But we don't want to be, accent we don't want to be, uh, exaggerate the risk. So, you know, if you eat it once in a while, this is the barbecuing season now, and it's okay. Uh, we're now recommending also that you cut your fish, maybe once or twice a week on the fish. And then our final recommendation is we haven't managed to wreck the plants too much yet. I haven't heard any articles about mercury or PCB in plants too much. So I would say that for the most part, we should try to eat mostly vegetables and then cut down on both fish and red meat. If you have a choice of fish or red meat, I still go for the fish, okay? That's our recommendation as far as today is concerned. Uh, and this was the article on fish. Uh, the inter this, I, forgot, I forgot one important point about this article. This article pointed out that the way fish are caught, uh, if you're worried about uh, uh, animal life and you're a vegetarian because of, uh, of that, but you eat fish, vegetarians who eat fish should recognize that fish are also caught in very horrible ways and tormented, and they die horrible death. Uh, they have these, um, apparently these, these uh, huge... Um, uh, long lines where they catch these huge nets where they catch the fish and apparently it's just awful how they they're there they're caught and they they on these barbed wires and they they are there for days and then they die like this so they said that it's also not uh, it's not humanitarian uh, for us to kill fish this way either apparently no one really feels that it's not humanitarian to kill a plant though so we're okay with that as far as I as far as I know um, a person once told me that it's uh, they're a uh, they're a vegetarian, not because they love animals, but because they hate plants, you see? So you can remember that one. All right, let's go to the next article. Uh, no. um, oh boy, we talked about this at the lecture with the, uh, the nurses, uh, Beaumont nurses, and that was this link with the mercury, uh, this thimerosal that's a preservative in the hepatitis B vaccines, and the link of that to autism. Now, if any of you in the audience have a child, relative, uh, nephew, niece, grandson or granddaughter who suffers from autism, uh, this is a harrowing uh, nightmare of a, of a condition and uh, causes inestimable stress and anxiety to the parents. Although the children themselves are pretty happy, but the, the relatives are very concerned and grieve over these things. Uh, and then they said, that could this all be, could the rise in the incidence of childhood autism be related to mercury in the vaccine for hepatitis B? So you followed this in the news. And we talked on, the, on, a, on a prior show about the relationship of hepatitis B 
vaccine and this autism, and we linked it to this drug called thimerosal, which contains mercury. When the Homeland Security Act was passed recently, Lilly, of course, has a very big lobby and makes the hepatitis B vaccine, actually was able to, to, to uh, lobby our Congress into adding to the Homeland Security Act a proviso that protects them from being sued by families who suffered from autism because of their vaccine. So those of you who liked our Homeland Security Act, you also have another little rider there that you didn't read. And that's that if you have an autistic child, you cannot sue Lily. Very interesting, isn't it? Politics in America. Anyway, the point is, what's my view? And I will tell you my view. At first, I was skeptical of the relationship. I found it hard to believe that a uh, preservative that had been used for years in vaccines could all of a sudden be causing autism. That is until the maker of the hepatitis B vaccine himself, who originally indicated no way this could be related, totally went 180 degrees and said, I do believe that the vaccine that I developed is causing the autism. That's the doctor who, who made the vaccine said that there is a relationship. So if you have an autistic child or relative, it may be reasonable for you to inform the family that there is the doctor who invented the vaccine that has uh, seen this link, and maybe that uh, we can get this uh, pr proviso that was added to the Homeland Security Act uh, vetoed, all right, and uh, maybe get some restitution to these families. I have an autistic nephew, and he, like I said, he's, he's very, very well adjusted, he's very happy, but you know that that autistic boy led to many problems in that family of ours, and, uh, and very expensive. My God, you can't believe what it costs to educate an autistic child, if you really have the money and you want to spend it. Well, we'll move on from that one. Uh, different show, different day. Uh, this was an article I wanted to talk about, but we already had the war, so let's go on to something else. Um, Give me one second here, Marlowe. Uh, an article that appeared in New York Times uh, trying to scare people out of smoking indicated, a, a patient actually gave me this and said the smoking causes wrinkles. And uh, the, the fact is smoking, because it reduces the circulation to the skin, does accelerate the process of wrinkling. So for those of you out there who are uh, unable to quit smoking because you don't care about lung cancer and you don't care about heart disease and you don't care about pregnancy, Maybe that, you know how Americans are always very concerned about the youthful appearance? Maybe the wrinkling thing may uh, affect you. So I'm definitely, that's why I put it on today's show. All right, steroids, dangerous lure for boys. Uh, again, this is a completely different subject. And this relates to the availability of steroids for muscle building in our youth. Um, if you went to high school, you recognize that one of the things that attracts girls, or seems to, is a muscular body. The seemed to me, and I went to Highland Park High School, and I can attest to this, that the, pr the prettier girls seem to be attracted to the football type people, the people with the big builds and the big muscles. Well, these days, you can get big muscles without exercising by taking steroids. So, put yourself back into your high school years, you're a 15-year-old 10th grader, um, and you have interest in building, bulking up your muscles, and there's a guy who's in your class who's selling steroid pills for 2 or $3 a pill. Now, most 15-year-olds in America today can get 2 or $3 a day. Is that not true? Am I missing something? Back in the time I went to high school, uh, you hardly had 35 cents for your lunch at Ferris School, you know. But Today, it seems to me that your average 15-year-old can get their hands on 2 or $3 a day. Therefore, they are able to afford the steroids, and studies have shown, no doubt about it, there's a, a possibility that your son may not be taking marijuana, your son may not be sm sniffing glue, your son may not be smoking cigarettes or drinking beer, but to your shock and dismay, your son is taking steroids. So if your son is looking particularly muscular lately, all right, you may want to question him 
on whether he's taking steroids. Don't, don't do it in an adversarial way. Just say, you know, son, I was watching a television show, and they say that it's the, it's the rage in high school these days to take steroid pills. Have you been taking any pills? Is anybody selling any pills like this? Um, just, you know, don't, don't be confrontational, because sometimes that, that produces a negative response. You know, I could talk all night. I have so many articles. On. Uh, this is regarding tougher meat safety rules. Anybody who thinks in the United States that, that, that we have round-the-clock inspectors at Farmer Jack checking over the meat you're going to buy tomorrow morning, is that what you think? Do you think at Kroger's store there are four or five inspectors picking up every steak? <laughs> is that what you think? How naive if you're thinking that. There's no inspections. There's some rules. There's nothing going on. Uh, mad cow disease, listeria, salmonella, E. coli, you know, the point is that the meat is a very perishable item, and that probably is your best rationale for becoming a vegetarian. If you, if you want to become a vegetarian, your best reason for it is the lack of any real uh, uh, inspections of meat. All right? If you yourself owned a farmer jack or owned a meat market, and your livelihood depended on it, and your, your most recent shipment of steak looked a little bit old or a day or two old, maybe beyond its prime, and you had already paid for it and there was no refund for it, what are you going to do? Come on, you're, you're the butcher here. What are you going to do? You're going to put it out for the people the next day or you're going to throw it all in the garbage? Your whole livelihood, that's your livelihood, right? Think about it. Be realistic, all right? Meat, if, now if you look at the, at the produce and you see wilted lettuce, you ever see the woman, they're out there on the, on, not just women, but men too, squeezing the peaches, looking at the cherries. I've seen people in the fruit market looking over cherries, looking at grapes, you know. Oh, they see a brown grape, put it back, right? That's why you should always wash your produce. But meat, then just put the meat. Nobody knows what to do with the meat. They just put it in the basket. It's fine. Somebody, the USDA is inspecting it, right? Wrong, wrong, wrong. So if you want to cut your meat, a very good reason is this. Tougher meat safety rules on the way. Don't make me laugh. You're making me laugh here. Cut your meat down, reduce your risk of, of getting sick from eating meat, and then obviously uh, uh, try to uh, purchase the most fresh meat that you can. I mean, you know, if you lived in the old country where my, where my family comes from, you actually pick the cow, then they kill the cow, you see? Then you go and free, you eat what you want to eat, then you freeze the rest, right? But we don't see our meat slaughtered here. You know, there may be some day. You know, when I was a boy, people still had animals in their yards. That dates me a little bit, doesn't it? In Highland Park, Michigan, in, in the 1950s, people still slaughtered animals in their backyards. They, they killed chickens. <laughs> it was unbelievable. But um, you knew the meat was fresh, didn't you? That's fresh meat. All right? It was alive. Now it's dead. That's fresh. Uh, when I was in Saudi Arabia uh, three years ago, uh, and I wanted to, um, to donate uh, a camel to the poor people, uh, I was told that uh, I, I could give uh, uh, a certain amount of money and that that money would, that would then be used to, to get, the, get the camel. And then I remember something my father told me when he was living, and that was when you slaughter a cow for the poor, always go and kill it yourself, right? So sure enough, I went, and I, I went down to where they slaughter, and I go, I want to slaughter the camel myself. So I, you know, I looked at several camels, and I said, I want that camel right there, nice healthy looking camel. And sure enough, I cut that camel's neck. And sure enough, the poor people came with wheelbarrows and sliced the meat off and took it right to their houses. Now that's fresh meat. You're not going to get any mad cow disease doing that, right? Maybe someday we'll be cut, we're killing our own meat. Or you'll go to a, a meat market and you'll see the, the animal and you'll have the animal killed. Another article on the estrogen, I want to skip over that because we're running out of time. Marlo, do you have any idea how much time we have left? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. We're doing pretty good today, I'm, I'm telling you. Social world may help keep the mind dancing. And speaking of dancing, have we been dancing around subjects tonight? I'm telling you, I've never been talking about so many diverse subjects in one hour show as tonight. As you know, as America ages, we now have over 50,000 um, centenarians, right? That means people over 100 years old. 50,000 people who are, are I'm sorry, did I say 50,000? Yeah, 50 million, may I am Marla correct? We have 50 million, no, 50,000, that are over 100, 100. Okay, um, 50,000 Americans have reached the age of 100. When I was a boy, for somebody to get to be 100, 
It was like, it made all the newspapers, you know. Now, every day on, uh, on Good Morning America, or, or, or this, you see people, hundred, 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 hundred. You see interviews with people. Why, what makes a person uh, able to communicate, speak, and tell you about what things were like in 1903? What makes a person capable of doing that a uh, hundred years later? The answer is, appears to be, c constant social interaction. It appears that a lot of what we call Alzheimer's Day is really more of a social, a social isolation phenomenon that we have yet to fully understand. If you are elderly, and when I say elderly, I'm talking about between 70 and 80, and you want to be sharp in case God has written that you should live to 100, then what you want to do is keep up your social contacts. That means email. That means phone calls. That means uh, church. That means restaurants. That means family visits. That means trips. That means getting out of the house as many hours a day as you possibly can. If you want to tempt Alzheimer's type uh, degeneration of your brain, if you want it to happen, then what you want to do is live alone, don't talk to people, don't watch television, don't write, don't call, don't email, don't go to church, stay alone a lot of the time. And sure enough, everything in your brain will start to decay. It appears that every time you talk to people, electrical sparks are flying around the brain, and this is what keeps the brain sharp. Just as lifting heavy objects strengthens muscles, many researchers feel that speaking, hearing, listening, seeing, communicating helps to sharpen the brain up in the same way. Uh, this theory is called the brain as muscle theory. All right? If you don't use it, you lose it. All right? These are important. We're all looking for a magic drug. You know, it's like the, you know, this is an American phenomenon. It's like the people that want to lose 100 pounds. It took them 20 years to gain it, and they want to lose it now in a month. People have a mother or a father, and their mother is getting senile. So they want a drug. Give me a drug that will fix this. You know, we have to get that patient reintegrated into society. It's sometimes a painful thing to do. If you have an arthritic knee or arthritic hip, you know, it's hard. You've got to have somebody helping you. You need a walker, a wheelchair. Michigan, what's worse than that? It's cold, wet, wet raining all the time. And we get, we get really terrible weather here. I've, only as I've gotten older, I, I really feel like, you know, isn't this weather ever going to get better? Do you remember April 1st, 5 below zero? Today's May 1st. We had 5 below zero April 1st. Have you forgotten, the, have you forgotten that ice storm in the, in the second week of April? Knocked all the power out? Uh, it's, it's not easy to get out in Michigan. There's a temptation to stay inside. So Michigan would be expected to have one of the higher alcoholism and Alzheimer's rates, and guess what? It does. Um, all right. So here we go. People hoping to stay sharp as they age often turn to crossword puzzles, math problems, and other demanding intellectual pursuits. But is that necessary? A new set of guidelines suggests just talking appears to keep mental skills sharp. I'm going to leave that on your screen. Would you please read it? Read that, because you're going to need this information for the next 20 or 30 years if you're 70. And I hope every one of you watching today makes it 100 and as sharp as can be. You know, how many people can you talk to these days about what was World War I like? What was World War II like? What was the Korean War like? You know? Uh, what was the Depression like? You know, we want to take care of our, of our centenarians. We want more people to get to be 100 to tell us that history. Again, same information. Fighting mental dullness with talk, talk, talk. All right. Let's go to our next. Uh, uh, this headline says it all. Uh, I, I don't have time to talk about this. We're running out of time. But uh, apparently this controversy of using marijuana for medical reasons, uh, now a doc, it's been shown, or it's been, uh, I guess, legislated that in federal court that uh, doctors can prescribe pot, and it may not be a good thing to do. Uh, but at least they won't lose their medical license for doing it. All right. um, attention deficit, not just for kids. Uh, I'm not going to have too much more time tonight to talk about. Uh, I have about uh, 300 more articles. You think I'm really kidding, don't you? I have about three. I had hoped to present 400 articles tonight. I have about 300 left. Attention deficit, not just for kids. In one uh, minute, let me talk about this. Attention deficit disorder has an alarmingly 
high incidence in adults. If you think that you are suffering from this, you should, you should actually bring it up to your doctor and say, doctor, you know, I've had some problems at work, problems with my marriage, problems uh, with my, my school, if you're in school still. Uh, could I have attention deficit? Uh, would I benefit? Many of these people are misdiagnosed as having like uh, depression or anxiety disorders when really they have adult onset attention deficit disorder. You need to bring it up to your doctor. Also, you have to recognize that there is an acquired form of this attention deficit and the acquired form occurs if you're not getting enough REM sleep. And as you know, a real epidemic in America is cheating away their sleep. Americans are cheating away their sleep. Uh, the average American male needs eight hours of sleep. The average American female, nine. Raise your hand out there if you're a female getting nine hours, and I don't see any hands going up. There's no woman in America getting nine hours of sleep. There's no male getting eight. Everybody cheats away from their sleep. There's so much to do. People are so busy. They're taking so much work home with them. Everybody's cheating their sleep. Then during the day, they've got this acquired attention deficit. They can't focus. They can't listen to anybody. If somebody gives them a half an hour lecture on how to use a new computer, they can't pay attention because they're not getting enough sleep. So anyway, I mean, these issues have to be brought up to your doctor. They're important, worth mentioning. And there is treatment, by the way, for the adult. All right. Uh, uh, a little article for those who out there have, who have daughters, especially if your daughter's slender. This is the window of opportunity to increase the calcium in your daughter's bones. All right, don't miss your chance and don't miss this window. The window is slowly closing after the menstrual cycle starts in the girl. The window slowly closes and your ability to calcify that girl's bones decreases. So this is the time to ensure the daughter is getting at least three full glasses of milk a day and then on top of that perhaps a vitamin supplement with some vitamin D and calcium. Keeping in mind that Michigan has these long winters with no sunshine and that vitamin D is usually obtained naturally from sunshine. So if we're not getting sun, we have to take a vitamin D supplement. So if, especially if your daughter is thin, the thinner girls are at greater risk. Uh, and again, this was an article we talked about earlier that no one has to tell you if your pacemakers are recalled. So again, if you have a, a cardiac device, uh, it's up to you to check with your cardiologist from time to time. Is my pacemaker still uh, uh, recommended? Um, an article on arthritis. This is a particular problem in Michigan. Uh, Michigan uh, really, instead of having the Great Lakes state on our license plate, it should have a picture of a walker, a cane, an arthritic, maybe an artificial hip, right? Because Michigan is the arthritis capital of the United States of America. Uh, what, what are the reasons? Well, there are many reasons. Uh, one of them is our climate. It's cold. It seems to uh, increase the risk of arthritis. I'm not sure how, that, how that's related. But anyway, we need to understand that uh, uh, the medical community has done a relatively poor job in treating arthritis, as evidenced by the, uh, the pr proliferation of over-the-counter arthritis remedies, such as SAME, uh, um, glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, etc. So what, what are we to do? Do you smear on the uh, Bengay? Is that the only treatment? Well, the fact is that um, what I tell patients is, uh, who suffer from arthritis is before you get that hip replacement surgery, uh, be sure that we have not, uh, that we've exhausted our arsenal of anti-arthritis medications. Uh, too many patients in our practice and elsewhere, I'm sure, are rushing into knee and hip replacement surgeries when we really have not adequately experimented with medications that could control uh, arthritis and arthritis pain. In addition to that, I will say, uh, to the credit of some of the over-the-counter manufacturers of medications, that um, some of these over-the-counter preparations, particularly glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, and to a lesser extent, SAME, S-A-M-E, have been shown to be partially uh, effective in alleviating arthritis pain. And if you can alleviate the pain, in many cases you can delay the surgery. By delaying the surgery, you give the prosthetic hip and knee making, making companies time to perfect their devices. Let me tell you something. If you had your hip replaced five years ago, I can already tell you now, there is a better hip that you could, have, you could have had if you had waited five years. If you had your knee replaced six years ago, there is a better knee that you could have put in today, you see? So 
I'm not saying that never have the replacement surgery. I am saying though that uh, that um, by delaying, you give the manufacturers time to perfect this science. The science has not been perfected yet. All right, we have not come up with a perfect knee or hip replacement yet. Okay, we are definitely running out of time here. Uh, I want to make a comment here about an article that appeared in one of the neurology journals about coenzyme Q10, and. Um, Many, there have been articles on CoQ10 in the past. The most uh, well-known article was the one indicating that a person with congestive heart failure could benefit by adding CoQ10 uh, to their diet. Since CoQ10 gets in the brain as a powerful antioxidant, uh, we now have information that indicates that both patients with active Parkinson's and those wishing to delay the onset of Parkinson's may benefit from using CoQ10. Uh, I'm not saying you should drop all your Alzheimer or your, your Parkinson medication. Uh, I am saying though that maybe you should talk to your doctor. Uh, would it be reasonable based on research doctor for me to take CoQ10 for my Parkinson's or for the prevention of Parkinson's? Uh, a couple of examples that Parkinson's is reaching into the younger population would be the fighter Muhammad Ali who has suffered from Parkinson's and also Michael J. Fox from Family Ties and Back to the Future. He was very famous and uh, again Parkinson's. There are other cases of young, uh, youth onset Parkinson's disease. So if CoQ10, a simple and not very expensive supplement can prevent this, uh, certainly it would behoove our audience to consider taking it on a preventive basis, much like we recommend baby aspirin for the prevention of heart disease uh, and maybe even colon cancer in our patient population. We are uh, very close to finishing uh, our time. We've got two minutes left. Uh, let's see what I can get through today. I'm not going to talk about that one. Um, please uh, bear with me here as I go through and find uh, articles. Oh goodness, uh, this was before the war. I wanted to talk about the effects of gas and what you could do. And Marlo, I'm, I'm having a hard time finding one. Okay, I'll finish with this one. We'll conclude with this article. Study ties cell phones to crashes. Um, there was a famous lawyer in New York who, while they were talking on the phone about a case, crashed and killed somebody. The lawyer's firm was then sued because the lawyer driving the car that killed the person was on a cell phone talking to a client billing the client for their time for the company. This is very interesting. If you have an employee and the employee uses the phone for business reasons and the employee injures somebody while they're on that phone, your company could be at risk. Okay? You understand that? You, and I'm going to close this with this comment. When I first started in medicine, there were no cell phones. When a patient paged me, I had to stop at a gas station and make the call from the gas station. You know, my patients get no better care because I have a cell phone than when I stopped at the gas station. I just used to stop at gas stations. That was a big thing for me. Nobody's life is really that improved with these cell phones. Most of the calls are personal. My advice is, before we go and close the show, please be very fastidious uh, about use of cell phones in the car. Use them for emergencies. Quit making personal and unimportant calls to the cell phone, and maybe you could save a life. All right. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Have a great uh, May. It's getting warm out, so let's go outside and enjoy the weather. Bye for now. Cuando me da un ataque de asma, me siento como un pez sin agua. Aprenda cómo prevenir el próximo ataque de asma de su niño. Porque inclusive, solo un ataque es demasiado.